So, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Steven Pigeon. I'm a professor of mathematics and computer science at the University of Quebec at Rimouski in the mathematics, and uh, computer science, and engineering department. And I'm also director of the math and computer science section. So, today, I want to talk to you about some techniques uh, to reduce memory foot, uh, footprints. Um, so why do we want to do that? There's many reasons. Embedded systems, we uh, don't have any more the embedded systems that I use as a kid. That means that even modest computers have many megabytes of memory. Um, you rarely encounter a, a CPU with 4K of RAM. It still does happen. Uh, maybe we want to save memory for mobile computing. More memory to keep alive means low, uh, less battery life. That sounds stupid, but it's, it's a fact. Uh, even in a free lunch type of an environment where you, we have servers with lots of memory, we still don't have infinite memory. We still have to uh, somehow uh, fit our simulation into those uh, memories. Uh, the more we fit, the better. Uh, also, playing with the cache hierarchy and I.O. Even if we have uh, super powerful SSDs with uh, PCI Express Time 16 uh, I.O., uh, the fewer blocks I read and write from those devices, the better. So if I can rearrange my data to fit, in a, uh, fit more in a block, I win so, uh, some, uh, uh, some performance. Of course, there are many, many ways to do that. I'm sure uh, Patrice here uh, told you about alignment and how to reorder fields in a struct or a class to make sure that I'm in place for you and doesn't you know, insert gap and fillers. Um, uh, Benjamin uh, just a moment ago told us that we could use uh, some new attributes to make sure that uh, zero class devices, uh, classes have zero memory. Um, but today I'm, I'm going to concentrate on two things. Pointers, uh, what can we do with pointers and how we can uh, choose a different representation so that they're more efficient. Uh, and we get a uh, look at what I call a snug fit. How do I choose the smallest type that contains the value I want without breaking it? So those words the two, uh, will be the two things we'll look at today. Uh, so of course, you're familiar with the uh, traditional data structure that are pointer rich. Like, I mean, sometimes most of the structure is pointers. <laughs> if you look at, for example, uh, a red-black tree, it has a pointer to the parent, a pointer to the left son, a, a pointer to the right son, and maybe more if the branching is higher. Uh, we also saw um, yesterday that um, in the talk that I think that everybody should, what everybody should know about uh, memory allocation, that calls to new and delete aren't cheap. We kind of assume that now, nah, okay, that's, it, it costs zero, it's, it's false. And even worse, several calls to uh, new and delete will eventually fragment memory. So uh, we, we kind of want to not use dynamic memory too much, not pointers too much, and there's a trade-off to be had between how few pointers we use and how the complexity grows. We're all familiar with ArrayList, uh, also known as SED vector. So there's a, uh, a, a kind of sweet spot where uh, if the vector isn't too big, inserting basically anywhere will still be faster than adding a node to a list. And, and that trade-off um, turns out to be uh, maybe several ten thousand, uh, tens of thousands of elements because 
new and delete are expensive. But then again, if we only use ve vectors, insert and deletes will be expensive. If we just remove from the front, basically we have to move everything around. That's not very efficient. So maybe a good trade-off would be to use what I call page list. So a list of vectors so that if you do standard um, vector style insert and delete, it, it's not too expensive. And it's um, going to allocate a page only when it's, uh, there's no place left anywhere. Still has pointer. So can we compress pointers? Uh, of course, the, the answer is yes. Um, it's a no by, okay, uh, of course. We'll be able to compress pointers because basically we, leave, uh, we live in a fictional world where the machine presents to uh, your program a logical address space that is way bigger than what you actually have on your device. Even worse, it's even bigger than what it can manage. Even, even worse, programs are usually small compared to uh, what even is even possible on your machine. If we look at x86 memory models, um, its implementation defined it depends on the CPU you have. Some CPU will uh, deal with only 48 bits of logical address. It will still make you believe that you live in a 64-bit uh, world, but the CPU itself will only manage a 48 bits logical address. And even worse, it will only manage 36 bit physical address. So whenever, uh, in whatever way you organize your, your memory, the CPU cannot deal with more than 36 bits at the end. After that, you get into a complication like the swap file uh, so partition, depending on the OS, uh, the OS you're using. Uh, and basically this gap here, where it's non-canonical addresses, is basically unaddressable. You, there's no way to build an ad, uh, a pointer that addresses that. And it's really, really huge. Basically the gap is something like 256 million terabyte kind of thing. So we can use that to um, build shorter pointers. So even if we do, don't do anything smart, we could use six bytes. Six bytes to do a pointer. We, but we can do better than that because even though the processor presents uh, to your machine, uh, to, uh, I mean, to your program, the abstraction of 48 bits address, it won't actually let that, uh, all that, memory to be accessed by your program because when your program is loaded it will be given segments so basically memory regions five or six depending on what's going on so uh, typical program this is a, basically the linux um, executable layout it may vary on your favorite os there's a code segment that's where the program actually lives there's data initialized data BSS, the block started by symbol, is the static initialized data, basically the stuff that's zero. Then follows the heap. So when you do new and malloc, uh, it goes there. And at the other end of the address space, there's the stack that grows downwards. Uh, for historical, uh, not historical reason, but historical reasons, uh, <laughs> it uh, grows down. Because at some point when machine had one megabyte of memory, it kind of made sense to have uh, the stack grow one way and the heap and the program the other way. So can we use that to um, uh, compress pointers? The only kind of pointers you can have, uh, first, uh, if I go back to the slide, uh, the gray gap in the middle is huge. It's really, really huge because it's in logical memory address, it's a very, uh, very large space, and it probably won't be used. So you either have pointers that point to something that's in the heap or your data segments, 
or maybe from this on the stack. If it's on the stack, we we'll say that pointer is stack-like. And if it's deep, it will be deep-like. So since I made the, uh, the assumption that it, it won't connect, usually it will be maybe 16 terabytes between the, the two or you know some, something that largely um, overflows your current memory so there's no danger to, to meet in the middle. Uh, I can detect that and make a pointer that's encoded differentially. Of course, it will be wrapped in a class that behaves like a pointer. So the end user doesn't know it's compressed. But either it's uh, relative to the stack or to the heap. Uh, normally, I don't really know where all this thing is because there's an address randomization that's done at load time for security purposes. But uh, GLibc has had the good idea of giving us symbols to find where, uh, where what starts. And so, uh, for example, we have data start that, that points to the bottom of your data segment. You can use that as a base for the lower addresses. And um, end, which is basically the, the base of the heap, if, if it's that what you want. So uh, this is part of the glibc. It's standard. It should be initialized with, to the right value when your program starts. Uh, so we'll need some kind of um, integer to store a pointer. Unfortunately, I've discovered that um, uint pointer t is optional, so it might not be there. So if it's not there, you supply one. And you need a couple of implementation-specific information, like the number of bits the machine supports. So that would be, uh, for example, detected at compile time. So the, the, the wrapper, the interface itself, it isn't too complicated. So basically, I take t, the, the, the thing I will point to. So it's not int star, it would be just int. For example, the number of bits I want. So maybe I want 40 bits or 36 bits. Because on my system, I should be able to reach all of, uh, available memory with that. And uh, as an extra optimization, alignment. I can provide the alignment of the pointer. Uh, there's a natural alignment. so if Int, it will be every four uh, address. Um, you might also want to exploit what a malloc or new gives you. It doesn't give you, if you, you say new something, it won't give you just any, any pointer. It will probably most always give you a pointer that's aligned on a block of 16 bytes. Just because it's easier to manage memory that way, there's no good way of doing that. Uh, it's also compatible with the basic alignment. So there's a max basic alignment, which is uh, implementation defined, but it's typically 16 bytes. So after that, we need a couple of things. One const expression function that gives me the number of bytes need needed to store a number of bits. So we have, if I say 36 bits, it will say five bytes. If I say 32 bits, it will say four. I uh, also need a couple of defined that are uh, implementation specific. The maximum address, the top of the stack, where is it? Um, then I will use a direction bit, which is the, the last bit of my pointer. So it's basically like, you can think of it as a sign pointer. If it's on, it's from the top, and it's off, it's from the bottom, the heap. Uh, and here, you, just here, you'll see that that's, your, that that's the actual da data that contains the, the pointer, the compressed pointer. So it can be an, an, any number of bytes. The fact it's a byte, it's a, uh, a byte array instead of, say, an int, is important because that removes the um, alignment requirement. I can have those two compressed pointers, one behind the other in RAM, and it won't 
align the next one to an, uh, a boundary other than a, a, a byte. So how do we compress that very uh, easily? We check if the pointer is closer to the top or to the bottom. We encode the difference. That's it. Uh, also check that the pointer is null. So if null pointer is encoded correctly and decoded correctly also. I check that here. So basically it's just this, the, the bottom is the smallest address I can have in my program, less one alignment of T. So that make sure that if I somehow make a pointer to the very first thing in the data segment, it, it don't, doesn't go as null. Decompression is very cheap actually because here there's a small Mac, uh, sorry, there's a small uh, template function that efficiently copies a number of bytes into a, uh, from one place to the other. I check if the resulting int is zero or not. If it's zero, it's an OPTR. If not, I check the direction bit. I do an add and a shift, or I do an add and a shift. So basically, decompressing a pointer is what, uh, comparing one bit, a mask, a shift, and an addition. So it should be uh, inexpensive. Uh, and it behaves exactly like a pointer. So here I, I create a, a int from um, a new. So I call new, I actually create a pointer. I use a compressed pointer with 36 bits. Of course it aligned to five bytes, but it works and I can use it exactly as a pointer and I can even call delete on the pointer and we'll call the, the delete with the decompressed value and everybody's happy. Uh, seems like a lot of work, but actually for pointer uh, rich uh, data structure, for example, again, a red, a red and black tree, we have parent and the two sons taking less space than two pointers. So it's a good game, I guess. So we, we fit everything in 15 bytes instead of 24. And it doesn't cost much uh, CPU wise. Uh, so we can, you, you can tweak values. Uh, depending on your architecture, your CPU, your available memory, uh, what you think your program will use in, in terms of, mem of memory. It has a very not strict alignment. So basically, since the basic type of that thing is a uh, character array, a byte array, um, it will not enforce any kind of alignment other than byte. So you can just pack them and having have them all snugly fit together in, uh, in your class. Uh, manage to, depending on uh, what you have on your system, you can have pointers that are two, three, four bytes shorter, which is fun. I mean, three bytes is okay. And maybe we can just hide that into something like a compressed unique pointer, uh, compressed share pointer, and just go on with our lives. It's just hidden inside. A, it behaves like a normal pointer, so we, we can just use them uh, without any problem. Uh, so that's an idea of using stuff that just fits in the, the right number of bytes. We often just do ah, whatever, int regardless of what we actually code. We do that very often. One example of that thing is enum. So even if we, uh, if we use a enum without um, any storage specification, the standard, the, sorry, the current draft of the standard states that uh, the underlying storage is just an int, which can be more or less big depending on your system. Uh, 
but we can specify storage. So we can say, okay, I'll, I'll store that on a, on a, on a character, so a, a single byte. But it's still somewhat wasteful. Clearly, if I only have like two, three values, I'm using a whole byte for two bits, two bits worth of information. So how can I do uh, something uh, uh, about that? Well, the first thing is that, oh, okay, I'll use a bit field and just cram all my info together. Uh, that version isn't very safe. It knows nothing about the number of values. I decided it's, uh, the alignment is character, but is it the best, um, uh, the best value there? I don't know. So uh, what I should have initially is a function that tell, a const expression function, or template, something like that, that tells me if I want to represent the maximum value of x, how many bits do I need? Because if the, the maximum value I want to store in my, my bit field is three, then it should answer, well, you know, only need two bits for that. And I also need a, uh, something that is type safe that will say, well, for, for that bit field and those fields, the shortest, the smallest possible um, integer type that will hold all of these is uh, this, this one. So we can do that uh, actually quite easily. Here I have a, a template that says uh, just end of uint, so you provide it with the number of bits and it will translate to a basic type that suits your, the, uh, your stuff. Uh, that has the advantage of being time safe. So if the, num the maximum value is a template parameter, it can be deduced. You don't have to go back into your code and check if uh, unsigned int is still good. You just use that. And we have also bits from value that will give me the number of bits needed. And when we combine, combine the two uh, together, we have uh, well, tell me the number of bits I need to start 10,000 and tell me what the type of the int I need to start. It. Here it would probably reduce to uh, UN 16. That's still wasteful. We're still not using all the juice in the bits. For example, if I have three bits and I only have five values, I basically have three values that are unused. Can I do something with them? Well, maybe. Uh, maybe something ad hoc, something, something that's just like, um, in French we have the mot bricolage, which is just like glued together anyway. Uh, so I want something more uh, systematic than that. And uh, I can ask myself, how efficiently do I use the bits? So one way of looking at it is uh, how many bits I would need to store, for example, five values. Uh, information theory uh, uh, tells us that uh, this um, quantity is proportional to the log two of the number of values. So if I want to be optimal in my use of bits, either V is close to N, so uh, to, the, to the N, so to use three bit, my optimal value, number of value would be eight. Uh, or I can take the problem around and say, no, maybe I, I could use a number of bit that's closer to the number of values I, uh, I need to encode. And that would be log two. Uh, so the best thing I sh uh, should be able to do is to use fractions of bits, not even whole bits, fractions of bits. And yes, we can. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump over this one. Uh, so we all agree that shifting by uh, shifting left by three bits is the same thing as multiplying by eight. <laughs> shifting right by four bits is the same thing as dividing by sixteen. So what does multiplying by five mean? It means bit shifting by log two of five bits. <laughs> that basically gives me the, the, the mean to bit shift left or right by an arbitrary number of fractions of bits. 
so typically we would do shift left, mask, uh, or to combine the value. Here the or, uh, the or uh, becomes simply the addition. If there's no carry, there's no problem. And so we can see that this operation, x times 5 plus v, is the same thing as x shift left by a, fraction, a fractional number of log 5 bits, or the new value. So that gives us a, 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 an easy mean of shifting right and shifting left. Shifting right is just division. Uh, ending the mask is modulo. That's the, the integer um, um, division. The, the rest of uh, the integer the division. So here I have three values. So what I do is I take the first one. I shift it by log five bits. I or in the new one, I shift the result by log three bits. I shift. Uh, I combine the new uh, the other value. This gives you, uh, gives me an integer that. Uh, is as small as can be. That is the smallest possible encoding for, for those uh, values. The inverse is Q, kind of. Um, modulo and division is inexpensive, and most of the time it's even paired as the same instruction in the CPU. So to extract the field, I compute modulo tree, then I divide and shift right by log tree. And I do the same thing for the other fields, so I can re, uh, extract those. Okay, so now I, I've, sh I've shown you how to do that for three values. I can do that for n values. And, okay, here there's a bad maths. Um, so, basically, what the only thing I need is the product of all preceding numbers of value. And I can extract um, a value. So, here is basically a shift right by all preceding fields. So I shift right out the whole thing by the sum of fractional bits that for all the fields that are before the kth one. Modulo is a, uh, the equivalent of my end mask. And I can extract any value. Uh, on the other, uh, the other side, I want to set one uh, one value in my chain of flags. I could do that um, the way I've, I've seen, uh, I've shown before that basically uh, shifting and adding everything. But here we will do exactly the same thing we do in binary. So basically take the lower part, masking the center, the, the value we want, and keeping the, and masking the upper, the upper part. So that's, that looks expensive, but it actually is not. Uh, first, because the product can be com uh, computed in, in compile time. Um, I can do that very easily with a small tail recursive Gantz expression. So if I ask for the product of the five first fields, that will reduce to the actual product. The actual code generated will be move the value into a register. It just compiles away. It's basically all compile time. It's inexpensive. And the two uh, functions I need for set and get, I can make them template members, uh, template function, so that also the number of the, uh, the field is compile time. Um, the product that will evaluate our compile time. So this whole thing here, product is compile time. Next, that gives the value of the field just after is also compile time. It's also a tail recursive uh, cut expression that will just go away in the compiler. And here also it's compile time. So if you look at the assembly, it will just do C mod a value plus V times a value plus uh, C mod a value. There's a, uh, my time is over. <laughs> uh, I have like for two seconds, uh, I'm done. Uh, so how do we implement that? Always uh, compile time so I can get um, 
the number of bytes I need for uh, to store a number of uh, said, sorry the number of bits I need for a specific value, and then I can deduce the storage type uh, from the number of bits. That's why I have here in the sub bit type, and I basically just define my sub-bit field, so it's not even a bit field now, it's a sub-bit field that lives in the bit field. And the only thing that you have to modify to change the list of um, fields is this uh, initializer list that contains the ranges of all uh, the fields. <sighs> Done. <laughs> uh, so after that, you should be convinced that uh, there's a trade-off to be had between complexity and pointers. We can compress pointers, and that you can do black magic with fractions of bit without killing a unicorn. Uh, you just rely on the compiler doing the jobs for you. Uh, there's so much more I would like to talk to you about, but uh, before I get the bouncer kick me out of the stage, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you.